Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to worship this morning on this Transfiguration Sunday. service based around the Messiah, I reckon we could have a great service. So welcome as we come and try to make some sense of the, the mystical, strange, otherworldly yet transformative story that is the transfiguration of Christ. As we meet here, we acknowledge, as we always do, that we meet on the lands of the Nanawal and Nambri people and pay respects to their elders past and present and pledge to join with them as we move forward. John, would you like to bring us our notices, please? So, uh, welcome to the seventh decade of the life of the St. Margaret's Church. Um, it was a great celebration um, last Sunday and many thanks to all of you who made it such a, a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, this, uh, over the next few weeks, well, Lent is starting um, on Wednesday, isn't it? I think, um, and so our, our study, our Lent study groups are starting. Um, you, you can see them on the front page of the, the pew sheet. Um, you've got different options. Uh, Julie is leading one uh, on Wednesday, the 20, starting the 21st of February at 2 p.m. in the small hall. 
It's on Practice Resurrection, A Journey Through Ephesians. Um, and you can talk to Julie about it and also um, put your name down at the back if you're interested in participating in one of the studies. Um, next Sunday, Simon is leading the worship and preaching. Uh, this week, there's um, Holy Cross are having a pancake night um, on Tuesday the 13th of February at 6 p.m. Um, with an all-age worship at 5.30 p.m. if you want to get into the spirit of Shrove Tuesday and Lent. Um, on Holy Cross matters, there's um, a pastoral letter from Bishop Mark Short was issued today um, to uh, try and uh, give um, Holy Cross a, uh, a new start with regard to some of the governance issues they had last year. Um, so there will be a new parish council um, which will be elected on Sunday, the February the 25th. And the chair of that parish council will be the uh, Reverend Tracy Matthews, who will be um, involved in a governance and renewal project um, with, with the Holy Cross leadership um, in, 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 in the next few months. So um, changes for Holy Cross, but, uh, but, um, and, and we're hoping and praying that those changes will, will help them um, move forward with grace. And finally, um, um, Sad, the sad news that um, Lisette Hayes, um, at, at, who's a resident at Ross Walker Lodge, her mother died um, yesterday morning. Um, the uh, funeral will be Wednesday week and details will be in the pew sheet for those of you who, who want, to, want to attend. Thank you. Thank you, John. And for those of you who want to join over a meal, Fork and Talk is on Friday night at our place, so please see Beverly or I. Um, if you are able to come and let us know what delights you're bringing, please share with me in our call to worship. Looks as if our PowerPoint is stuck. Oh, <laughs> thank you. God, you bring us together in this place. We come to be fed, to be renewed, to seek understanding. God, you challenge us in this place. We embrace the challenge, trusting that through challenge we grow in faith. God, you are revealed in this place sometimes in shining glory, sometimes in tears and struggle. God, as we worship in this place, refresh, renew and challenge us so that we would see anew your wonder. Amen. Please stand as you are able and share with me in our opening hymn, Nature's Beauty, to the tune Regent Square, which is a very familiar tune.
for our prayers of giving thanks and saying sorry this morning. I'm going to ask you to do the work. I want you to take a moment and think about your past week. Think about what happened starting from when you left this place on sometime Sunday afternoon for most of us um, with dishpan hands and feeling very full and probably moving furniture etc through your week till arriving here today. I want you to think about a couple of things over that week that you are really thankful for. And I want you to think about one thing that if you had your time over again, you'd probably change. Let's spend a moment bringing those things into our consciousness and thus before God. Two things that we're thankful for over the week and one thing that if we had our time again, we, we would change. And then I'll bring us together. Let's pray. Holy One, you give us so many joys. Sometimes it's hard to choose. But amidst those joys, there are times when we act, we think, we behave in ways that we know don't do credit to either us or to you. For our blessings, we are thankful for our failings we are sorry and we ask that you would help us to continue to be thankful and continue to be determined to change those things that get in the way. Amen. Friends, hear good news. On mountain tops and in valleys, in our homes and in our hearts, God knows us better than we know ourselves and God forgives us even when we struggle to forgive ourselves. By God's mercy we are forgiven, by God's mercy we are made whole, by God's mercy we are equipped to serve others. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, let's share the peace of the Lord who wants us to be whole, wants us to be bearers of light and wants us to be followers as much as we are able. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let's share the peace.
Let us again sing another song to the tune of Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, which I know you'll, you will know the tune. And the hymn is called Sisters Let Us Walk Together. And it was written in response to a, um, a shooting in Montreal about 15 years ago where about seven women were killed and this song was, was written in, in response to that. It's only short, but it's very beautiful, and it will be our offering I was going to tell you a story now, but we've cut that for a, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I thought there was going to be enough in the service anyway. Secondly, Freddie and Jocelyn aren't here because this afternoon is Jocelyn's birthday celebration. And thirdly, I had ordered the book from Belconnen Library and they said, oh yes, it'll be at Dixon by Friday, not a problem, and it ain't there yet. So, given that we are still grappling with how to get the, the narration and the pictures to sync, um, I thought we would leave it for another time. So let's move on to our Eco Minute. And thank you, Barbara, for this wonderful graphic. I'd always gone with the R's of, um, of, re of recycling as the three reduce, reuse and recycle, but Barbara's found this wonderful graphic that uh, says there's in fact six of them, which is great. And I really like the first one, refuse. I think perhaps we could do a bit more of that, say, no, sorry, not going to buy that because it's, it's overpackaged or whatever. Um, I don't know if you... No, but there's a little cafe on the foreshore in North Sydney um, which refuses to have um, re uh, refuses to have single use cups. Um, every couple of weeks they scour the op shops in the area and buy as many mugs and cups and so on as they can and they serve their their coffee in those. People are free to take them or free to return them and they will be washed, or free to return them next time they come and they will be refilled. Only a small thing, but I thought, good on them. But what I wanted to um, focus on this morning is that idea of reusing. Um, as I said a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago, we seem to always jump to the recycle, but that's down the hierarchy. That's, that's something to do only if you can't avoid using the, 
the product or the material or the resources or whatever. But we should be looking to refuse, reduce, and if we do have to buy things that have packaging, etc., try and find, find it with something that we know we can reuse. You know, take egg cartons back, bring, bring egg cartons to tucker box. We're, all, we're always looking for egg cartons because, because we get bulk eggs and we have to repackage them into half dozen lots. So egg cartons are always welcome and a great way of re reusing. So let's think about how we can adopt into our, our lives in a small way but an important way, the R's of recycling and reducing, etc. Yes, <laughs> yes, I suspect we could have a, a really long list of R's, couldn't we, depending on, depending on what, the, what the issue was. Beverly. Which isn't an R, but it's a, and very, you know, very um, del deliberately the very bottom, the smallest part, and that's how, how we should be trying to reflect our usage of the resources with minimal landfill. Robin, would you like to be as our readers? Reading this morning, the New Testament reading is uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 3 to 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ our Lord, and ourselves as servants of Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in the hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory, displayed in the face of Christ. The Gospel reading is from Mark 9, 2-9, Transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took Peter James and John with him and led them up to a, up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he did not know what he did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them. And a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. One more song before you get to listen. Uh, a Carl Dorr song, We Have Come at Christ's Own Bidding, and another familiar tune for you. Please stand as you're able, remain seated, seated if that's more comfortable for you.
This morning's reading, and I'm going to focus on the gospel reading, this morning's reading has, has so many possibilities and so many ways you could take it. But I want to focus on the three disciples. Because today we reach another threshold occasion in the story of Jesus and we've jumped to the end of Jesus' ministry period, which given that Epiphany is short this year anyway because Easter's pretty early, is a little bit confusing to realise that we've jumped from early... It doesn't seem, seem very long ago at all that Jesus was starting his ministry and being baptised by John, and now all of a sudden we're flipping to the end. But that's the way of the lectionary and the way of the church year, isn't it? And this event that we've called the Transfiguration is an event noted by all three writers of the Synoptic Gospels. And it's a story rich with imagery and significance. And Mark's account of it is by far, as usual with Mark, is by far the briefest and most succinct of them. It reminds us, if we needed reminding, that the Bible is a series of stories about God and people trying their best to follow God in an overwhelmingly pre-literate society. It's really easy for us to forget as we take education for granted, that Jesus and most of his disciples were almost certainly illiterate. And we do well to remember that in a pre-literate society, truth and insight was passed on through story. The Jewish people and their religious leaders didn't do theology in the way that we would understand it. If they wanted to make a point, they told a story. And so this morning's gospel tells us a threshold story about Jesus and his ministry. So come with me for a few minutes as we journey into the story. We follow Peter and James and John the three disciples that we might call the inner cabinet of Jesus. And they've now been following Jesus for almost three years. They've seen lots of wonderful things. They've seen things that they struggle to make sense of. And they've been part of changing lives and changing communities. But when they pause to take stock, I wonder if they are also realising that Jesus, while a hero to the poor and marginalised, is starting to make serious enemies among the religious elite with his stories about a new way of living. I'm sure they would be very conscious that enemies of the religious elite in first century Palestine, tended to come to a sticky end. I wonder what they're thinking as Jesus leads them to the top of the mountain. I wonder if it's beyond the realms of possibility, and I don't think it is, that Judas's fears were in some small way shared by the other disciples. Where is this going? What is happening? And then at the top of the mountain, they, they witness this mystical event. An event so out of their sphere of understanding that they struggle to comprehend what they are seeing. An event that seems almost to unfold outside of time, or at least collapse the boundaries of time 
as the trio of puzzled and dazzled disciples witness Jesus' exchange with Moses and with Elijah, two of the hero figures of the Jewish scripture. And as they struggle to make sense of it with Peter's very understandable response, let's stay here and, and enjoy the moment. But as they struggle to make sense of it, Jesus asks them not to talk about it with others, but to hold it amongst themselves. And so, I suspect a little bit puzzled, they return down the mountain. And as they return down the mountain, they re-enter the rhythm of time, rejoining Jesus as he engages the world and takes up again the work he has come to do within it. And in their re-entering, revelation settles in. Because Peter and James and John can no longer see Jesus or the world as they had once done. Because what they witnessed on the mountaintop, they haven't left behind. What they saw there now infuses what and how they see here as they live on level ground. But if you go a few verses ahead of the lectionary into Mark, we find that reality sets in fast. As immediately following this passage, we have the story of the disciples trying and failing to heal a boy possessed by a demon. And we have the disciples having to listen again to Jesus telling them that he will be killed in the near future. It was important that Peter, James and John have that mountaintop experience. But it wasn't important for them to tell the story, not yet, because that wasn't the point of their outing. The point was that the experience would work on them, shape them, and continue to transform and perhaps even transfigure them. And the knowledge that they carried would alter every future encounter with Jesus, with their fellow disciples, with those to whom they ministered, and with their life after Jesus' death and resurrection. So what are we to make of this story? I think we do a disservice if we reduce it to just a story that leads us from Epiphany to Lent. It's easy just to see it as a bridge and, and sort of almost gloss over it as this is the opening to Lent. Yes, it is a bridge between the enlightenment of Epiphany and the soul-searching introspection of Lent Lent that is a season all about discerning what it is that we cling to and what we need to practice letting go of in order for Christ to become more clear in us. It is a great passage to lead us into Lent. But Lent will come around soon enough. In the meantime, where does the story of Peter and James and John connect with our story? What questions do we need to ask ourselves? How do we navigate the journey that our feet, that, that our feet trace between the mountaintop experiences and the flatlands? What questions do we need to ask ourselves? What do, we, what do we find ourselves tempted to cling to? And how do we practice letting go of it? Where and how do we rehearse 
the transfiguration that Jesus and God seeks to bring into our lives. The persistent invitation of Jesus is to take what we have seen, what we have experienced, what we have felt and what we have found down into the trenches of everyday life. That's why we don't stay on the mountaintop. That's why we come down to the valleys, to where the people are. Because the temptation after one of these thin places experiences, and I'm sure we've all felt it, one of those experiences where something really seemed to touch you and you thought in some inescapable, unexplainable way God is here, The temptation is to preserve the moment, as Peter longed to do. Yet rather than staying in the one place, rather than creating a safe place, we need to keep practising that transition. We need to keep rehearsing the journey that moves us from being recipients of wonder to being people who transformed and, shall we say it, transfigured by what we have received can then offer these wonders to a broken world, a world which needs wonder, which needs healing, which needs joy and love and acceptance. And having seen the light of Epiphany, and having practised being transformed and transfigured, then we can prepare for the long shadows of Lent because we don't know what thresholds we'll encounter in the wilderness. We don't know how God might invite us to change, to grow, to cross over. We don't even know how much we'll allow ourselves to be invited to these experiences. And we don't know what losses and sorrows these crossings might include. But if this week's stories bear witness to anything that's true about the life of faith, it's that we can trust the one who invites us to cross over we can trust that resurrection lies on the other side. Amen. Our listening song is a a song by a Catholic hymn, hymn writer called Transfigure Us, O Lord. Promise 
Jesus prophet. Transfigure us, O Lord, transfigure us, O Lord. Break the chains that bind us, speak your healing word, and where you Let us pray. We pray for the people of Austria, Liechtenstein, and Switzerland. We give thanks for the quality of life that many in these countries enjoy and their commitment to provide for those in the world who are in need. We pray for environmental practices that preserve the natural environment, especially the Alps melting glaciers. We pray for the work of justice, reconciliation and peace pursued by the people and organisations here seeking to shape globalisation so that it benefits all. Gracious God, we pray for our extraordinarily beautiful world that she may continue to grow in beauty and complexity despite the damage we humans do in our selfishness. May your spirit guide us in how to wisely care for the earth so that our needs for food and shelter are met in a way that replenishes and rejuvenates our amazing ecosystem. Gracious God, we pray for our political leaders and public servants that they may serve all the people rather than acting only according to their selfish interest. We pray for our lawyers and judges that they may wisely and with courage guide us according to the rule of law rather than the law of the jungle. Our politicians, public servants and lawyers are often ridiculed by the press and the people. May your spirit encourage them to keep serving faithfully in spite of the unjust criticisms they get. In the presbytery today, we pray for people in education. We pray for university chaplaincies, campus ministries, and Christian student groups as they commence for 2024. We pray for students among and around us commencing studies this year especially those starting uh, primary, secondary or tertiary education for the first time. And we pray for those teachers who teach and support students in their learning. We pray for theological colleges, the new and continuing candidates for ordained ministry and those who train and mentor them. We pray 
for those who are in a period of vocational discernment, that it may be a, a discernment to understand where you, O oh Lord, want them to serve. Finally, we give thanks for the opportunities available for each of us to learn and grow, reaffirming our call as disciples to be lifelong learners. And we pray for the communities of St. Margaret's and Holy Cross that we may be a light on the plains to show the way to your kingdom of mercy, joy and a fair go for all. We pray your blessing on the Toy Library, Tucker Box, Friendship Group and Ross Walker Lodge and your guidance and strength for our pastor Julie Connor and for the Reverend Tim Watson. We pray for comfort for family and friends who are suffering as they mourn the death of a loved one. Particularly pray for the family of the Seth Hayes. Grant us peace as we mourn and joy as we remember the good times with the one who is now left to be with you. We pray for healing for those wounded in heart and mind. We pray that those struggling with mental illness, that they will know that they are loved and worthwhile, even while their mind is out of control, that they will have safe and secure housing, and they will have opportunities to participate fully in society. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, and pray the Lord's Prayer that from New Zealand. Life giver, angel, source of all the Our final hymn is Bless Now, O oh God, the Journey. It's to the tune of Webb, which I know won't mean anything to you, but if I tell you it's to the tune Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, I'm sure it will mean something to you. So please stand as you're able to sing the last hymn. Oh, we're singing it to another tune, which I'm sure will be wonderful. <laughs>
friends as you leave this place and into the coming week. May you experience the presence of God with joy. May the holy cloud comfort you. May the divine voice encourage you. And may the power of the Spirit transform you, transform us, and transform our world. Amen.